we know that our body, our tone of voice, even our the minute muscles in our face and our facial expressions, children are reading our own heart rate, being aware of that and using our breath to that advantage and lots and lots of empathy. Of, oh, I can see you're having a really hard time. You must be exhausted. Yeah, it's really tough, you know, and that will help keep us calm. But our children will, we can be the external regulators for our child. Welcome to the Soaring Child podcast, where parents of children with ADHD learn tips and tricks to help their child soar at home, at school, and in life. We feature interviews with experts, medical professionals, and parents just like you who are learning how to reduce ADHD symptoms using food and other natural strategies because children with ADHD deserve to soar just like every other child. I'm your host, Dana Kay. Welcome to the Soaring Child podcast. This week, we are exploring the next step, how to parent a child with ADHD. I'm Dana Kay, your host, and today we're talking with Ashley Gobel. Ashley is a highly experienced therapist with over 15 years experience. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's in social health and counseling, and a master's of social work qualifying. She has also completed a range of certifications on family trauma, developmental trauma, attachment theory, and so much more. Now she works in a variety of contexts, including childcare, schools, child and adolescent mental health, domestic and family violence, family divorce, and childhood trauma. She has lots of experience with children who have been given the diagnosis of ADHD, ODD, and learning difficulties. She also shares her knowledge with other professionals in the sector by running a variety of educational training programs. Now it's time to welcome Ashley to The Soaring Child. Hi, Ashley. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Donna. Thank you for having me. I am super excited to dive into this topic this week. It is a big one and we're going to dive straight in because we've got so much to cover today and I know that if we we chit chat and chit chat we're going to you know miss out the time. (laughs) So let's you know let's go right at the beginning. Where might one person consider starting out on the parenting ADHD road? Yeah it it I think for so many parents, when I speak to them, it can become a really overwhelming start of, oh, what do I do next? My child's got this diagnosis. What do I do next? What does support look like? I think from a therapeutic perspective, um, I often encourage parents to almost take a pause moment and really sit in a bit of reflection, maybe process their own feelings about the diagnosis, process what's happened so far in their road around getting that diagnosis and how difficult things may have become in the home, in the family and in relationships for that child. And really, I guess, kind of sit in some self-reflection around accepting um, what's what's been happening before you can kind of move into that next phase of, okay, what does support kind of look like and and what might need to change in terms of my parenting approach? Yeah, so the, look, lot I, of the work we do. Uh, I yeah. just want to stop you there and, and say I think that that's, a really good piece of advice because I know that, you know, when I was going through this with my son, uh, we got the diagnosis and for me it was a relief, but, you know, I straight away turned into like, what can I do next? What can I do next? What should I do here? And I really didn't have time to let myself, you know, experience what that meant. So I think that's an excellent piece of advice. Yeah, it's almost, you know, we talk a bit about with families around almost slowing it down initially. Mm -hmm. I just kind of slow that process down and go, okay, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, do I have a relief about having that diagnosis? Does it create more overwhelm? Do I have a sense of sadness or grief or whatever is going on for that that parent or that family? And then I I do think the next step is stepping into um, perhaps adjusting the, the particular parental mindset that maybe has been happening already, looking at, okay, what is the type of parenting approach that my child with ADHD needs, which can look very different to traditional parenting styles mm-hmm. and parenting approaches. So when I say adjusting that mindset, 
um, it's really important that we start kind of avoiding really negatively charged labels that sometimes can happen for kids with ADHD. You know, they, there's often a lot of feedback around them being defiant or challenging or difficult or naughty or bad. And whilst they've been given that diagnosis and, and that comes with a lot of symptoms that parents see, moving away from some of those negatively charged language descriptors for children and starting to shift that mindset into, okay, my child's not the problem. Um, you know, it's that it's the symptoms, it's things that are creating um, the behavioral difficulties for that child, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and maybe moving into more positivity in some ways. So exploring what does my child do really well, um, looking at that strengths and that ADHD doesn't have to be, um, you know, something that's a really negative thing that means there's no hope for that child to succeed, that we know there are, you know, and we're going to talk about oh, it today, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> so many people out. Yeah, celebrities out there, um, entrepreneurs, these superpowers that come with having ADHD. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think another huge step in starting that parenting journey is, okay, what, you know, gaining knowledge and developing a deeper understanding of what exacerbates ADHD symptoms. Mm -hmm. What's, you know, I talk about looking beyond behaviors, you know, what's underneath behaviors, um, what's contributing to a really maybe emotionally charged atmosphere in the home. Mm -hmm. And what are those sorts of things that actually aggravate ADHD symptoms, such as, you know, food, um, what are other things that cause inflammation? <laughs> yeah. The particular yes, emotional yes. atmosphere at the home stresses at school, family stressors. Um, there's lots of research to show that all those sorts of things can really, there's lots of factors that can impact on where that child sits in the intensity of their symptoms. Um, so as a parent kind of, you know, can you go out and look for that information, gaining a deeper knowledge and understanding, all right, okay, what are some of those factors that are going on in my home, in my child's life, and where do I have some control on what I can reduce? Where would families look for, for that type of information to, you know, trust uh, the source? Because we know, we know there's, there's so much out there these days. And I think that that's one of the things that I struggled with when uh, I was going through it with my son. It was like this mountain of knowledge. Uh, and the, yeah. Yeah. And that is it. It's, there's so much on Google <laughs> that you can just find, you know, an array of things that can be, I almost add to that overwhelming journey mm. of where do I start next? Um, I think it can be really helpful to find particular programs or practitioners that um, use a holistic view. So I think that's really important. So I kind of weeding out, you know, is this person I'm speaking to, or is this piece of knowledge too hyper focused on medication without looking yes, at yes. other factors is this too focused on you know one thing but actually looking at more of a holistic approach so you know it could be helpful to go is this person taking into account more than just the medical model of ADHD yes. um, is it looking at food is it looking at um, parenting approach is it looking at school environments that can sometimes Everything. exacerbate ADHD so you know is it is the piece of information or knowledge that you're reading taking into account more than one thing um, and there is some really great um I guess, knowledge and research in terms of books. I know um, Dan Siegel talks a lot mm -hmm. about neuroscience and ADHD. Dan Hughes, Kim Golding's work from them is really highly trusted in the area. Gabor Mate does a lot around ADHD as well. He's another fellow Canadian <laughs> um, around what are those contributing factors that can, yeah, really increase Exacerbate. ADHD. Yeah. Uh, I, I like to look at it um, as a pie. Okay. And we're trying to bake the best pie possible. It might not be the best pie in the world, but the best pie that we can make. And that pie has many ingredients and that pie, you know, diet is obviously a huge, uh, a huge, um, uh, a part of that, that recipe, but also it's, as you said, the school component, uh, what's going on in the home and so many other ingredients, you know, it might be a bit of chiropractic care. It might be essential oils, not the essential oils by itself won't be the be all and end yeah. all, but <laughs> it might be a little ingredient that is in that pie that we can help absolutely. make the best pie possible. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great little metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I can't take full credit for it. I, uh, <laughs> I heard that a number of years ago and I'm like, I am totally adapting that to ADHD because I think it is 
Fantastic. Um, so Ashley, you have a, a large experience and knowledge of neurobiology. Um, and based on this, what do you think is important to know about ADHD from a neurobiological perspective? And firstly, take a step back for those that don't know what neurobiology is. What is it? <laughs> yeah. So um, for the last um, couple of decades, I've been doing lots of study and research around how the brain operates, mm -hmm. um, child yeah. development and, and how that yeah, develops in our brain all the way from the bottom up brain development, we call mm -hmm. it, you know, some from in utero all the way through to adulthood. And um, yeah, neuroscience talks about our nervous system and how that um, impacts on brain development and how, how it all, how the whole system works really essentially. And, you know, how do we uh, make sense of the world? How do we take in out you know, external stimuli, how does our brain interpret that stimuli mm -hmm. in our sensory experience, our physical experience and our emotional experience. And so when we're thinking about children who experience ADHD, it can be incredibly important to hold a deep understanding of their nervous system and how they make sense of the world around them may be very different to how, you know, um, others atypical. experience yeah. yeah atypical children experience the world so children with adhd there's research to show they're hypersensitive in their mm -hmm. external stimuli and internal so you know they may experience sensory um you know sounds touch smell much more heightened or more lowered than other children they have you know a lot of sensitivity to emotional stimuli so a lot of parents will say you know but i've you know i've i barely kind of spoke loudly but my child thinks I'm yelling at them or you know I barely touched their hand and they think I'm hurting them or you know they're feeling things much more intensely and deeply um because their body is often on such high alert for that stimuli mm -hmm. and then their brain is really quickly trying to make sense of it and create a message of am I safe am I okay am I not and often their internal world can be kind of, I'm doing this because that's what I, I imagine what it might feel like for, mm, for a child with ADHD. Definitely. Like, you know, duck with the little, you know, the feet under the water, just in hyper arousal most of the time. So even if they're not showing it on their face, their internal experience is one of um, really heightened heart rate, let's say, you know, breathe, shallow breathing. Mm -hmm. um, so is that what hyper arousal is? Yeah, and, and so it's anything that kind of keeps us in a heightened um, state, mm -hmm. you know, our nervous system on high alert. And um, what is that, that like the fight or it. flight response? Exactly. And so what we see are externally is fight, flight, or freeze, mm -hmm. um, those survival mm -hmm. responses. So when we move way out past our window of what we can tolerate for distress, you know, we move into fight, flight, or freeze. And that can look like in behaviors of ADHD, mm -hmm. screaming, yelling, fighting, um, you know, hitting, running away. Um, you know, the, those really, those behaviors that parents often go, it's so challenging, it's so difficult, or it feels really defiant. You know, the automatic nose, um, mm -hmm. all those behaviors actually stem from a nervous system response in the body. Uh, and if that you just child. think about that, how tiring would that be for that child? Absolutely exhausting. Mm. Yeah. So we know that when you're in a state of fight or flight or really chronic hyperarousal, there's lots of that cortisol, you know, the stress hormone, adrenal mm. glands are going. And as you know, Dana, with, with food is that inflammation just continues to add to that experience and keep them sure in a heightened does. state. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so uh, taking, you know, this into account um, and this knowledge and what type of, you know, parenting approach is sort of needed for children that are in this hyper arousal or, you know, experience ADHD? Yeah. So in terms of parenting approach, I think it's incredibly important to hold this information and go, okay, actually, this is my little one who's operating from this highly sensitive nervous system. And often parents will say once they develop that deeper understanding, it helps them sit into more empathy and compassion for that child. So it helps them stay more in a neutrality or a calm approach. So when we think about what does the approach look like for parenting, we talk about it as a, a responsive, positive parenting approach, mm -hmm. one that really needs the parent to um, be self-aware. I know there's lots of, you know, that's kind of a key ingredient of the pie is a parent to have a deep self-awareness of how do I operate in my parenting? Is my parenting approach actually exacerbating 
ADHD symptoms. Um, you know, what's going to be most successful for my family if I work for change and work for a calmer home environment? What's going to sustain that change is going to be a parent who's able to self-reflect, who's able to stay calm in those really triggering moments. Know what your triggers are as a parent. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be, you know, not every day is going to be perfect. Um, and it's not. And uh, I, um, uh, my eight year old who doesn't have ADHD, he had a big afternoon yesterday afternoon and he went to soccer and then straight to baseball and he came home and he was absolutely oh. exhausted. And I knew that that was going to be the case. And so, uh, you know, I needed him to have dinner and basically go straight to bed. Um, and he was losing it. And so I just sat there and I said, I understand. I know you are really tired and I got all of those techniques from you, Ashley, because <laughs> um, I interviewed Ashley yesterday, actually. Um, and so I was in the right frame of mind. But as I talked like this, he can't calm down. He sat in his chair. He ate his dinner and then he went upstairs and he had a shower. But if I had gone, come on, come on, come on, we've got to eat dinner. Could you imagine what would have happened? The meltdowns, the cryings would yeah. have ensued. It would have kicked off. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. So, and that's a beautiful example of how we use neurobiology and that neuroscience understanding in relationship that we know that our body, our tone of voice, even our, the minute muscles in our face mm. and our facial expressions, children are reading our own heart rate, being aware of that and using our breath to that advantage and lots and lots of empathy of, oh, I can see you're having a really hard time. You must be exhausted. Yeah. It's really tough, you know, and that will help keep us calm. But yeah. our children will, we can be the external regulators for our child when they don't have the internal regulation that they need. Yeah. And I want to say to all the listeners out there, uh, I don't know about you, but I can tell you just by Ashley saying that and taking that breath, calmed me down and so there is a very peaceful aura going on on this podcast interview and can you just imagine if you then brought that into your home how that would de-escalate -escal your child when they're in that fight or flight mode yeah absolutely this stuff works and parents tell me over and over again you know oh what would Ashley say you know what's what's <laughs> no I've had yeah absolutely you know how do we and you know every parent will have their own different little flavor to it but it's really about keeping that that tone of voice and lots and lots of parents said the other day over the top empathy yes know, and win you know and, and show children that we can deeply hear what's going on for them and their emotions no definitely and so what are some of your top tips i know that that's probably number one but what are what are some of your top tips of how to respond to some of those more difficult adhd based behaviors you know maybe uh that yeah, i know you've talked a lot about flipping their lid and maybe you can explain that but then you know what do parents do in that moment yeah, so flipping the lid is a great little, again, way of understanding the brain. Um, you know, we know that there's the, the thing about your wrist and your arm is the brain stem. That's in charge of just your basic breathing and, and eating and digestion. And then we have um, the, you know, emotion center of the brain, the amygdala, which is in charge of all the feelings and the messages that get sent to the rest of the body of, do I go into fight or flight? And then the fingers, when you bring those down and curl them up into a little fist, that's um, represents that frontal cortex, which is in charge of problem solving and logic and language mm -hmm. and everything we need to make good positive decisions. But if we know that for, for children who experience ADHD, they're often operating from that amygdala, overactive amygdala, which is emotion center, that, that part of the brain that's, you know, there for logic and reasoning is often offline and flipping the lid. It's gone a lot of the time. So we actually need to speak to the emotion part of the brain and help them regulate that space before they can bring on the part of their brain to make a positive decision. So when we think about those top tips, um, concepts like name it to tame it, name that emotion, guess it out loud, wonder it out loud and use curiosity in order to calm and tame the feeling that we're noticing. So that might look like, wow, I can see you're really angry right now. Oof, I'm noticing some clenched fists. Now we're stomping our feet. Yeah, we're really angry. Oof, that's a big feeling I'm seeing. Or even wondering out loud if you don't know. Have a guess as a parent. Hmm, I'm wondering if you're 
you feeling a bit worried today? I can see on your face you got some worry. Maybe that's coming out in frustration. You know, just because we see frustration and anger, it might actually be a different feeling underneath. Mm-hmm child anxiety sits often really close with ADHD symptoms as well lots and lots of worry so naming feelings out loud verbalizing what we're noticing in behavior helps build the experience for that child in in having a deeper awareness of how they behave and how their their feelings come out in the world so noticing when they're stomping their feet noticing if they're being unsafe in their bodies you know oh I can see you're being really unsafe I'm seeing hitting and kicking and screaming this must be such a big feeling that you're having Um, it's kind of like children will learn about the world through our experience of Mm -hmm. their experience yeah and so so, storytelling if, if they're if you're naming and taming do you just name and tame until they stop? How, you know, what, what happens from there? Yeah, sometimes it can be enough to bring it down. Mm. Sometimes it's just riding the wave of emotion. So, you know, naming it and but also holding the parenting limit, um, you know, where we need to, saying, you know, no, you still actually can't have the TV on or you're not able to have that piece of chocolate because that was what we discussed is just not okay at 9 o'clock at night, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, whatever the parenting limit is. Um, you might have to uh, remind children over and over again, children with ADHD, lots of lots of prompting and reminders of what the expected behavior is, mm. what the expectation is. You know, we are going to bed at this time, you know, reminding them of that's not a safe behavior. We actually need to be kind. So, you know, parents will say, oh, I sound like a broken record. Yeah, because we actually need to continue to ride that wave of emotion and every time show up the same way as a parent with consistency. Mm. And, yeah, sometimes it is just repeating over and over again. But and it's without being problem. consistent, isn't it? So, you know, if you if you take that stance once, You've got to take that stance always because they'll know that, oh, well, if you do it once and then you don't do it, they know that they can probably walk all over it and they'll keep doing it. But if you continue with that same stance and that consistency, that's when you start to see results. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. They start to experience us as parents and as predictable. Yeah. So not only do they go, oh, mom, your mom or dad is really, okay, this is how we do things now. Oh, mm-hmm. my feeling is being heard. You know, oh, they are there for me. They continue to show up in that way. Um, you know, I often say to parents, if you can Mm -hmm. try to stay with your child in that emotion, it's really important. You don't disconnect in the relationship, walk away, send them to their room. You might need a break as a parent. And there's sometimes where that's okay, (laughs) you know, but you might need to verbalize that to your child. You know what? I'm starting to feel a little bit like I've got a big feeling. I'm going to have a little walk away. I'm going to go and get more calm because I really want to help you. And then I'll be back to check in on you. That's great. Rather than, you know, there'd be kind of a punishment for that big feeling Mm. and we disconnect and reject. So if you can sit with your child, stand, be near, you know, and be that resource or that external regulator for them um, with within, you know, reason if you do need those breaks because it's exhausting for a parent as well. It is. And what are your thoughts on uh, touching them during those moments? I think every child can be quite different and remembering that ADHD kids may experience sensory um, sensory very different. Some children absolutely need that, need that deep proprioception. They do need touch. They might need even just a little handhold. I'm doing that, you know, the tips of their fingers squeezed, hand massage. They might need a hug. They might need to be rocked, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's all those soothing of the nervous system responses. You might, invite them do you need to come in and for a cuddle do you need to come and sit with me I've done it where I've just sat shoulder to shoulder with a child and we swayed together while they're Mm. really upset um some children absolutely can't manage being touched so that's where we just use our our tone of voice and our breathing and our words to to the best way that we can to to support them in that experience I've even done it where I've handed bits of paper to a kid having a meltdown and I just said, just rip it, get it out. And, you know, and that child just ripped that paper for a few minutes and we just, and then just slowly came down. And part of that may even connect with Donna, what we spoke about earlier with that parenting approach is knowing that sometimes it might take five minutes and sometimes it might actually initially take an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, those big meltdowns, it might take 20 minutes. And how do we kind of accept that sometimes we might not get where we need to be? And that's really tough. But with consistency, 
that, you know, this can make a huge difference in a couple of weeks. And that meltdown that used to be 20 minutes is now three minutes. And the kid goes, yes, I'm feeling angry and that's not fair. And then we move on. <laughs> Fantastic. And that's what we all want. And, it, you know, that that is the that's one of those ingredients. And so, you know, yeah. one of the ingredients we talk about is diet and that reducing that inflammation in the brain so they can make those logical decisions as well. So if you tie that in with your parenting and those changes, think about, what dramatic difference you can have in terms of their symptoms and that peace that you can bring back to your life. Yeah, huge, absolutely huge. Remembering every time that we do a consistent parenting approach and use empathy, it builds a new neural pathway in their brain. Mm. And, you know, it's a new learning opportunity. So, you know, even using every meltdown as a teaching moment to go back once they're calm and go, oh, I noticed this in your body. What did you notice in your body? Mm-hmm. What could you have done differently next time? What did you need from mummy in that? moment you know and as parents as well we can go back and go I probably shouldn't have yelled or maybe it was unhelpful when I did this every difficult moment can also be spun into a teaching teaching that really helps them develop pathways so the next time it happens you can go this is that big feeling again in your body like a volcano Remember, we spoke about doing deep breathing or whatever Mm -hmm. that might look like for him. For sure. Well, I think that's a great place to uh, stop here. Um, uh, Ashley, do you have any, what's your parting words of advice (laughs) to a parent that's just starting on this journey with ADHD? Parting advice. Uh, I have that, I guess, an imagery around just riding the waves, sailing through, Um, and and this is a journey you know it's a journey and you will get there with the ingredients um, to bake that pie Mm -hmm. and and you will get there and there can be beautiful success for you and your child and we can see beautiful calm environments you can get there Fantastic. What a what a great parting word, um, Ashley. Uh, so if anyone feels like they need extra support from Ashley, Ashley and us have actually partnered to bring out an ADHD Thrive Jumpstart for Parenting program. And that can just help you jumpstart on your parenting with your ADHD child. We will drop the links in the comments below. Uh, and if you've got any questions, be sure to reach out. Ashley, I want to thank you so much for being to, here today. You have made me calm. Uh, I am sure you have made all of the listeners calm, but given some really, really good tips that they can now take and apply at their home. I'm definitely going to be having you back on the podcast again for a regular uh, episode because I just think that this is so needed uh, for families with kids with ADHD. But thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Donna. It was great to be here. Fantastic. Thank you for listening to the Soaring Child podcast today. To learn more about how to help your child with ADHD soar using natural strategies, visit our website at adhdthriveinstitute.com. Dot com and follow us on social media at ADHD Thrive Institute.